Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It's another great Sunday here at 153greatfish.website. Well, we have an important study today that should affect everyone who has obeyed the Acts 238 covenant. But let's pray and invite the presence of Jesus. Lord, we ask you, God, to anoint our study today. Lord, reveal your truth to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, right to the PowerPoint as usual. And uh, let's talk about the priesthood the priesthood of all believers, the priesthood of all believers. This is a topic that has been explored by uh, many people, but uh, I'm going to give it a, a kind of a thorough twist today. So let's, let's check it out. So here's our outline and introduction. They shall all be taught by God, the priesthood of Melchizedek, and calling an election and anointing. Those are the topics we're going to talk about today. So first off, we have to become a priest, okay? And every believer in the Acts 2.38 covenant is a New Testament priest. Now, the, the family hierarchy of DNA descent has been abolished. This is not a hierarchical priesthood. This is an egalitarian priesthood. And it's different than the priesthood of the Levites. There's many people today that want to create and sustain the Levitical priesthood. I'm not just talking about Judaism. I'm talking about church people who would like others to think that there are popes and more important people than others when the Bible tells us that God is no respecter of persons. So the first thing we want to get rid of is any prideful popery, any infallible priests out of this priesthood. If you've got a, a pope or a priest who thinks they're infallible, I recommend you begin praying and fasting for them, that God could bring them to a proper understanding of this priesthood. And last, Jesus alone commissions and ordains the New Testament priest. Uh, many people feel that they need to go to a seminary to get ordination and certificates from people. Although these things are helpful, they are not essential. And uh, they can be of great benefit, but they also can be a hindrance. So let's uh, examine this a little closer. Here you'll see the apostles uh, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, as described in Acts 2 and 4. And uh, they went on to confirm their covenant and make it elect their election sure by obeying Acts 2.38, being baptized in the name of Jesus. So the Bible tells us that the New Testament priests shall all be taught by God. Jesus refers to this in John 6.24. He synthesized and summarized three uh, prophetic passages regarding the New Testament, priesthood and seminary. And uh, he said it this way, they shall all be taught by God. And these are the three verses that he's referring to, Isaiah 54, 13, Micah 4, 2, and Jeremiah 31, 34. You should stop this video and replay it and examine those passages along with John 6, 24. So the New Testament priests are not to, to bypass discipleship from other priests. There is a bar mitzvah process from lamb to ram. Now we read about this in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, and John 21, 15 through 17. Uh, here we see in John that Peter's commissioned to uh, feed the, the lambs and feed the sheep and the rams, okay? And that's a growth process. There is a bar mitzvah when somebody goes from being a lamb to a ram, an elder in the faith. And that is a very important process. And so that process is accomplished through discipleship. But eventually, we must decrease and Jesus must increase. In other words, eventually, the teaching comes primarily from Jesus not from our mentors who won us to Christ, who taught us our initial Bible study, who helped us grow in Christ through a Sunday school or through uh, some sort of discipleship course. Eventually, the Holy Ghost has to take over. Now, at Qumran, they recognized that there was a teacher of righteousness coming. They interpreted Joel 2.23. When you read the phrase, latter rain, they interpreted that word in Hebrew, more zadok, to be teacher of righteousness. And so they were looking for the Holy Ghost, although they didn't quite understand it. They thought it was going to be some sort of a, uh, a political messiah, some sort of a great sage, rabbi. Of course, Jesus was all those things with the exception of a political messiah. And they were looking for the teacher of righteousness. Many people who study the uh, scrolls of Qumran and the writings of this uh, priesthood, uh, Levitical priesthood, are amazed at how similar they are to the teachings of John the Baptist and Jesus. Now, Nicodemus approaches Jesus at night. He's a scholar, the premier scholar of Israel, yet he's blind. His seminary did him no good, and Jesus, of course, schools him in John 3, 10 through 13. 
just because you went to a seminary has no bearing on whether you are being led into all truth. And that's the real story behind Nicodemus. He was high, he was lifted up, he was a scholar respected by everybody in Israel, but yet he was blind as a bat. And Jesus told him, you know, you have to be born again. In other words, your seminary, your teaching, doesn't really do you much good until you're born again. So Jesus also was frustrated with his own disciples' blindness and inability to know who he was. You can read about this in John chapters uh, 13 through 17. And then Jesus makes the statement, we're going to read it here just in a second, that the Spirit will lead you into all truth because they did not understand who he was. These are five very important uh, uh, chapters after the uh, Last Supper. And of course, dining with Jesus is to learn and to know who Jesus is. Now, one important point here is that sola scriptura, this is the doctrine of Martin Luther, is never taught in the New Testament. I'm going to explain that. This is a false doctrine, and I want to talk about that here in this uh, study today. So let's move on. Here we go. Nicodemus, he's a scholar yet blind. Jesus said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. This is found in John 3, 10 through 13. What's Jesus saying? He's saying that his teaching, he's the teacher, descended from heaven. And he still manifests in us as the Holy Ghost. You have to understand one thing. When Jesus resurrected, you are seeing a visible Holy Ghost. When he disappears and walks through walls, you're seeing the invisible Holy Ghost. He walks into the room because Jesus is the visible Holy Ghost that dwells on the inside of us. That is the teacher of righteousness. And yet Nicodemus didn't have it, so he is blind. Yet he'd been to the best seminary that Israel had. He was the teacher of Israel, but he was totally blind because he did not have the Holy Ghost. Jesus is frustrated with his disciples' blindness. He said, I still have many things to teach you, but you are not able to receive them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will lead you into all truth. For he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will proclaim to you the things to come. He will glorify me, teach you my identity, because he will take from what is mine and will proclaim it to you. What is this verse saying? That there is a third person of the Trinity, He, the Spirit of Truth? Not at all. Jesus is referring to the future when He will resurrect the visible Holy Ghost. When you see Him standing there in front of, uh, of uh, Mary Magdalene, or when you see Him walking in the walls with Peter, you're seeing the visible Holy Ghost, the teacher of righteousness. And when He's invisible and dwells in us, He is the teacher of righteousness for us. And that's why he uses this personal pronoun, he. And he will proclaim it to you. He will lead us into the spirit of all truth. All truth. He will teach us. This is what God wants us to know, that we will all be taught by God. That's our seminary after we receive discipleship. So, this agrees with the acrostic psalm. Recall that an acrostic psalm follows the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Beth, etc., to the 22 letters of the, of the alphabet. And so let's look at this acrostic uh, Psalm, especially 25, 4 through 5. Dalet, which is the Hebrew letter for D. Show me thy ways, O Lord, Yahweh. Teach me thy paths. Derek, the paths of righteousness. That word Derek, anybody who's named Derek, your name means the path of the Lord. And then He, which is one of the most common letters used in Hebrew alphabet and words. It says, lead me into thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. Now, He's going to lead us into all truth. The, the Holy Ghost is going to teach us. And he's the God of my salvation. He's Elohim Yasha. This simply means Elohim Jesus. He's the God Jesus. I have waited for thee all the day, David says. And so the teacher of righteousness, the Holy Ghost leading us into all truth, teaching us, is in agreement with this acrostic psalm. So the message Jesus in the Old Testament declares that God himself will teach seminary in the church after we've been discipled. Thus, Every spirit-filled believer willing to receive the instruction given by the Holy Ghost has been to divine seminary. The master teacher is Jesus himself. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're as blind as a bat. You're as blind as Nicodemus. You'll never get all truth. 
Go to Acts 10.46 and find out how to receive the Holy Ghost. Go to Acts 19.6 and find out how to receive the Holy Ghost. Go to Acts 2 and 4 and find out how to receive the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the manifestation of Jesus Christ inside his church. That is us. He is the light of the world. And so, Sola Scriptura of, of Martin Luther, and it's found in many evangelicals and Calvinists, quote this over and over again, but it's a false doctrine. It's foreign to the New Testament. Here's what Isaiah 28, 8 through 11 says, For all tables, okay, how you eat is a table, are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no clean place. So then he asked the question, rhetorical, whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Now he's going to answer this question down here, for with stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to his people, okay? But in the middle, he gives how the table gets full of vomit. Them that are weaned from milk and drawn from the breasts, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. This process here is describing the process of logic, scripture, uh, uh, sola, sola scripture, right here it is. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. That's sola scriptura. However, that's a table full of vomit without the Holy Ghost. So, this is how we teach his knowledge. The scripture plus the Holy Ghost to reveal what the scripture means. And that's going to be confirmed throughout the New Testament. So this doctrine here is false. You can't uh, come to, to all truth simply by reading scripture. So without the Holy Ghost, you are blind. If you notice, the tabernacle had two important pieces of furniture. It had the table of showbread, which represents the scripture. There were six loaves on one side, six loaves on another side, the 66 loaves of the Bible, 39 in the old, 27 in the new. And then it had the seven uh, lamp, uh, lamps of the menorah. You need the light, the Holy Ghost, the seven spirits of God, the Holy Ghost to understand the word of God. Sola Scriptura is a foreign doctrine in the New Testament. So, Jesus said this, You do not have his word abiding in you, for the one whom that, that one sent, this one you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for you think in them you have everlasting life. The scriptures alone do not provide everlasting life. Now, they're part of it. They need Jesus, and they are the ones witnessing concerning me, and you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Jesus is the life the Holy Ghost inside of us. When you get the Holy Ghost, you get the invisible Jesus manifesting in our life. And when Jesus resurrected, you're seeing a visible Holy Ghost. Sola Scriptura is a foreign doctrine in the New Testament. It says it this way, For he received from God the Father honor and glory, and there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son. Notice that it's the voice in whom I am well pleased, and this voice which came from heaven we heard. When we were with him in the holy mount, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. He's talking about the scriptures. Or unto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, unto the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Now this is a reference to the Holy Ghost, Jesus in us, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. If you study this passage here, 2 Peter 1, 17-20, it's saying that the voice of God, the Holy Ghost, the day star in our hearts, must be with the sure word of prophecy, the scripture. Those two things produce leading us into all truth. Sola Scriptura is a foreign doctrine in the New Testament. And uh, I just showed you the scriptures that prove that. Also, consider that logic and scripture alone creates the table of vomit. Truth cannot be revealed this way. In reality, the truest meaning of scriptures can only be revealed by the Holy Ghost. If you haven't had the Acts 2 and 4, Acts 10, 46, <clears throat> Acts 19, 6 experience, you are limited and you are blind and you need that experience. Without the Holy Spirit, we don't have the light of the world. We must be taught by God. No seminary required. However, discipleship is required. And if God himself teaches us, then we must discern truth by the confirmation and activity of the Holy Spirit. That's the whole purpose here of the priesthood of all believers. So, the priesthood of Melchizedek is described in these four chapters here, four and a half chapters, Hebrews 6, 13 through Hebrews 10, 23. I recommend that you study this, read it, and you'll see the differences between the Levitical priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood. Melchizedek, of course, met Abraham when Abraham had defeated the kings that had captured his uh, nephew Lot, and he tithed to Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is called the king 
of righteousness. He's, that's what Melech and Zadok means. Melech means king. Zadok means righteousness. He's also called the king of Salem or Jerusalem, the king of peace. And of course, we see that this man was superior to Abraham because Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. The greater then blesses the lesser. Melchizedek then blessed Abraham. And of course, uh, Abraham gave him tithes of all. And we see that tithing continues in the New Testament because we are a Melchizedek priesthood. And this, of course, is found in the uh, uh, great scripture, Psalm 110, verse 4. Now, Jesus is the high priest of this priesthood order, the Melchizedek order. Now, we who are the adopted sons of Jesus Christ, we're not natural sons. This is an egalitarian order. It is not a hierarchical order like it would be if we were Levitical or natural sons. We would have to prove our DNA, prove our patrial lineage to uh, the family of Aaron. That's all been done away with. Melchizedek's family tree is never listed in Scripture. It's because it's an eternal priesthood. Now, I don't believe that Melchizedek was Jesus Christ manifest as a theophany. Many people believe that or an angel. The Bible never says that. It says that his priesthood it was different, and Paul didn't quite understand it, and neither do us. Let's just accept that he's a man of God. He was a priest. He was, he was greater than Abraham, and he blessed Abraham, and Abraham tithed to him of everything he won when he defeated uh, the captors of Lot and, the, and uh, of the people of Sodom. Abraham rescued them. So, the Melchizedek priesthood ministers with greater redemptive blood than the Levitical priesthood. The Levitical priesthood ministers with what we would call the blood of bulls and goats, which is far inferior to the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the great redemptive blood. And of course, when we as ministers minister in the sanctuary, we are ministering the blood of Jesus Christ, especially in the Acts 2.38 covenant. When you repent of your sins and get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Ghost, the blood is involved. And you are receiving the blood of Christ, the redemptive blood of Christ. So we're a nation of kings and priests. We're a royal priesthood. In other words, we are just like Melchizedek. We are just like Jesus Christ, our high priest. This is why our priesthood is superior. It has kingship as well as priesthood involved in it. It's a royal priesthood. And the ministry is perfected. This ministry is perfected by fruits of the Spirit and gifts of the Spirit. It's a better covenant. And holiness is imparted by the Holy Ghost baptism to us and uh, we do not have to follow a bunch of rituals to try to make the ground holy. Everywhere we are with the Holy Ghost is holy. It's a ministry of holiness, and it's a ministry of redemptive blood. And the imperatives of our ministry is repentance and faith, not rituals and circumcision. Uh, we're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, which is buried with him in baptism. Repentance and baptism is our circumcision. And it is the faith towards God, repentance and faith towards God, found in the doctrine of Christ, which is important. And you, need, you should read about this in Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, and 2 John 1 through 1, verse 9. Stop the video, take time to read those scriptures on what the doctrine of Christ is. And these are the first two imperatives of that doctrine, repentance and faith. Okay, I've been going on here a little bit quickly, but I want to conclude this study with the calling and the election and the anointing, those three things. And uh, this priesthood, the apostle, instructs us to make, to verify, and confirm that our calling and election is from God. So we need to utilize the ASK process given in Matthew 7, 7, which is to ask, seek, and knock, to have the will of God revealed to us, ASK. And we need to uh, uh, focus on this process until our calling and election is made known to us by the Holy Ghost. And then, of course, it's confirmed. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. Now, the Bible talks about this priesthood is to dwell in unity. And unity comes from tolerance, humility, and love of the brothers, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. This is a group activity. Unity, tolerance, humility, love. We need to tolerate. This is probably the most difficult one for all of us. Every one of us is different. We need to tolerate the differences in the body of Christ. Some are tall, some are short, some are white, some are black, some are yellow, some are red. Everybody is different, different culture, different, uh, different mentalities, different education levels. Tolerance is the key. We need to put up with one another and love, that's the agape word, love the brethren, not just in the filial sense, but in the agape sense as well. And we need to have humility. We need to submit one to another. We need to 
properly view that we are not in some hierarchical priesthood. When that unity arrives, there is great anointing, and all the fivefold ministry offices appear through the gifts of the Spirit when we have unity. We get the seven ones of oneness, and then we get the, the uh, fivefold ministry appear if we have unity. This is found in Ephesians 4, 1 through 13, the recipe for unity. So the, the fivefold ministry emerges. We get apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all our royal priests. No popes required, no popes allowed. And of course, uh, we need to study out what these five uh, uh, ministries mean. Everybody fits within one of these cat five categories. Okay? And uh, even though you might be used just in the gift of helps, you fit somewhere in this, uh, uh, what I would call categories of ministry. These are categories of the uh, New Testament priests. So unction or anointing is embedded within us priests as we mature in fruits and gifts. And this is important. God gives us fruits and gifts, but he tells us the more excellent way is the fruit of love. That's the best fruit. It's superior to even the gifts of the Spirit, and we see that that's the best fruit, and the best gift is prophecy. Now, you can read about the best fruit in 1 Corinthians 13, immediately following a description of gifts of the Spirit, and of course, in 1 Corinthians 14, it tells us that the best gift is prophecy. Love and prophecy, fruits before gifts. Seek the fruits, and the gifts will come naturally, and of course, uh, in my studies, you'll find out that there are Twelve fruits of the Spirit, as defined in, in Revelation 22, verse 2. And there are ten gifts of the Spirit found in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and uh, Revelation 3.10. So that's, that's important. Finally, the Lord confirms our calling through the body of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit. This is not an infallible process. And I want to just finish with this. Is that the head of every man is Christ Jesus. We need to obey his direction and submit wherever possible to the body of Christ. But there are sometimes will be obstacles in the body of Christ, and we need to make sure that Jesus Christ is our head, not a man. If we allow a man to be our head, we are in idolatry. We have replaced Jesus Christ with a vicar. We've replaced him with a pope. No one is to take the, the, the place of Jesus Christ. He is the only father we can see. There's only one father of this church. His name is Jesus. Okay, anybody else who calls themselves Holy Father, infallible? Listen, we should always submit one to another where we can. But keep in mind that the tares set with the wheat. If God has impressed upon us to fulfill a ministry and people are trying to stop us, either out of jealousy, they don't believe in us, they don't have God's mind, be submissive to them where you can, be peaceable with them, but by all means, follow Jesus Christ first before we ever follow men. So every Christian needs a mentor. However, we can have a corrupt mentor. These people must be peaceably ignored. We don't fight with them. We just peaceably ignore them to accomplish the work of the Lord. Make Jesus Christ your God, everybody. Don't get an idol in your life. Many ministries have been stopped because they, someone saw uh, uh, another a Christian as God. There is no other person who's God. It's Jesus Christ alone. He is the high priest. And that's where I'm going to stop today. And uh, it was fast. It was furious. Uh, 25 minutes. I'm sorry I spoke so quickly, but you'll need to go back and uh, re-examine this video and uh, consider, uh, you know, uh, what it's talking about. Every New Testament Acts 2.38 believer is a priest. You're a king. You're a priest. Now, we're going to rule in the millennium when Jesus Christ returns. When the invisible Holy Ghost becomes visible again, then we're going to rule with him. God bless you today. hope you enjoyed the study. We'll see you next time for another edition of 153greatfish.website.